Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in proving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopath. You know, I don't know if today's episode is going to be long or if it's going to be short, but I do know it's going to be appropriate and it's going to be effective for specifically now, which is March 24th, 2020. This happens to be the 100th episode of our podcast, so that by itself would be a an opportunity for celebration. But the world is really pretty weird right now, and... Maybe we'll listen back in a year or two, and this will be the the middle of the trough of what has become known as the, you know, settle at home in the middle of the COVID-19 isolation. So we have experienced a worldwide pandemic, and the experience is unique in the sense that it's actually physically isolating. We are all at home. In some states, we are mandated to be at home except for essential services like going out and shopping and such. But for the most part, we are all meant to stay at home. It's not even a curfew. It's stay at home. That's amazing. So for Americans, most Americans saying, well, that's against my rights. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. At the same time, we look back to 1918 and the pandemic of the Spanish flu, which really wasn't the Spanish flu. It was just, they were the first to acknowledge it. And we say, well, actually the thing that really helped get over the Spanish flu was the fact that people did isolate themselves. And that example is used the difference between Pittsburgh and St. Louis and Philadelphia. Philadelphia ignored the restraints, thinking wishfully that there was soon going to be a vaccine for the Spanish flu. They were wrong, and consequently, the health inspector allowed a huge parade. I don't know if it was the Mummers Parade, but in October, and they had uh, the worst outcome for the entire country. So clearly, the variable of being isolated on a per-household basis is important. And we now have oh, YouTubes or uh, bits and pieces of information for whatever media you're watching of people in... Uh, various parts of the world saying, stay at home. You know, all the emergency care workers saying, stay at home. You're actually helping people by stay at home. You know, stay out of the picture. Don't be a statistic. And also don't get contaminated. If you're contaminated, think of all the other people that you would contaminate. So this has been pretty obvious. This is sort of the overall lockdown idea. Along that, to explore this little bit a little further because there's some logic here. And just like when anything gets to be public, it gets to be uh, watered down to the point that it is a little bit oversimplified. So ideally, if everybody actually could stay in their homes for those, except for the service of going out shopping and such, if they could stay in their homes for the next two weeks, period, we all walked in, stayed in our homes, and we figured out what to do. And we could probably be over this very, very quickly. Why do I think that? And by the way, I'm not the only one that thinks that because here's how it's going to go. Let me just go to a site that I use to give me some of the the facts here. So let me give you to the minute the accuracy of what's going on in the world in this global 
pandemic. And we'll get to worst cases and best cases and things we can extract from that. And then we're going to go on to an overall immune protocol that I think is very appropriate. And I think you should listen to it. And I think you should implement it. And by the way, I don't have any financial gains in saying this. So we'll get to that, but that's the thumbnail sketch of what we're going to be talking uh, talking about today. So as of this minute, on March 24th, uh, late in the afternoon on uh, the East Coast of the United States, we have total confirmed, this is from the St. John's, uh, St. John's, Johns Hopkins University, COVID-19 global cases, et cetera, 400 and pretty much 410,000 worldwide confirmed cases. We have a total of uh, 18,000 plus deaths. And then we have uh, a portion, about a quarter of all the cases have become recovered. So that's pretty interesting. In terms of the most number of cases, the most number of cases is still in China. And uh, by the way, at this point, Wuhan, I think tomorrow, or maybe it's today, their public service uh, transportation service is going to go back to 100%. And it looks like the population there will be back to work 100%. So it's been for them, at worst, a three-month work interruption. I think far less than that, but let's just throw in three months. And right now, the political talk is uh, taking time off is going to be too much of an economic burden for the United States outside of a couple of weeks, if we can even do that. Trump, this isn't plus or minus Trump, by the way. This is just saying what the conversations are currently, sort of marks it in time. Trump is thinking that this is, it's too big of an ask to say that we're going to take all this time off to protect people from the virus because people die from other causes anyways. And he used the example from just because people get die on the road, we don't take their cars away. So that's where the conversation is right now. But anyway, in the world, um, about 82,000 cases have been reported in China. Behind that is Italy, uh, coming up to about 70,000, 69,000 plus. And Italy is considered now the epicenter of COVID-19. That is SARS-CoV-2, or is the virus. And in part, it's the contrast of, first of all, China discovered they had this issue and they made these massive hospitals to take care of the population, which is very impressive to have that kind of coordination. So they quickly closed down, isolated people as much as they possibly could. In Italy, apparently that was the number one a tourist destination for a lot of Chinese, who knew? And they were not a population that was really inclined to shut anybody down, to build anybody's hospital. So they are overwhelmed. They are not at the they are now at the point of those who are 60 years of age or over. This is in northern Italy, Lombardy. Um 60 years of age or over and in a respiratory unit that they have to take the ventilators away and give them to younger people. So in other words, the ventilators are, there's not enough ventilators there. And so the sparseness is having them create a kind of a triage, who is most likely to survive, not the old, but the younger. Let me in, interject here back to 1918 flu epidemic, which is about 16, two years overall, and that there was actually three waves there. So when they try to compare the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, that it's a little bit of an unfair comparison because there was three waves in 1918. And the first wave was for the older and then for the younger. And then the third wave, which is the one that came in, uh, in the fall of 1918, was for the middle age. So all in all, everybody got hit at one wave or another. Right now, we're seeing a wave that, according to the data coming out of Italy and out of China and somewhat out of South Korea, which has been testing a lot, that it is mostly about the older, uh, the elderly. And the elderly with certain comorbidities. So comorbidities are other conditions that they had other problems. They clearly had anybody who was a smoker put them far more at risk. That's for obvious reasons. This is a respiratory virus. So if you're already compromising your respiratory facilities, your lungs, and then your heart, um, you will be at risk. That's sort of saying the obvious, I hope, to you. And then after that was diabetes. And after that was obesity. And after that was uh, hypertension. 
and and it goes on from there. So, what are some of those things for the, that set of comorbidities? You know, absent the smoking, and if you were a smoker, that's kind of self-induced, and we know that uh, it's it's the number one most associated cardiovascular uh, it creates most of the problems for our lungs. So, pull that out, and what we have is obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and heart conditions. Do you hear or do you see a vascular theme in that? So when one becomes overweight, obese, pre-diabetic, diabetic, diabetic, what does that mean? Well, obviously you have elevated blood glucose levels. Well, what happens to elevated blood glucose levels? That creates a vascular problem. Call it endothelial problem of the vasculature. So what areas would you be concerned about? You'd be concerned about heart, you'd be concerned about head. So diabetes in general, or having chronic elevated blood glucose levels, which is basically what diabetes is, that you will have heart conditions, issues, you'll either have a narrowing of the various uh, arteries and veins, uh, mostly the arteries are concerned about, in the heart and likewise for the brain, and that is stroke or various degrees of stroke or heart of various degrees of uh, heart problems. You also can have things like phlebitis, but it's basically a vascular issue. So that's the comorbidity really. It's vascular problems caused, and this is the jumping. They don't say it this way. Um, it is a co, it's the, these are the conditions that are created by chronic elevated blood glucose levels. So there you go. So why would I say that? Well, this is basically a low carb. This is keto naturopath, which is low carb. The low carbs are basically guiding or training your blood glucose to operate at a much lower level, you know, 80s, 70s, you know, as the norm. So as you come down from wherever you are, that's a goal for you to get to well comfortably within those normal readings. When you go and to get blood work done, the normal readings are now over 100. That's too high. It just means the average of the population is getting too high and they're getting sick. So you really can't compare yourself to that. You got to be more specific. Okay. So now back to the theme of COVID-19 and vascular conditions. If you even start today to drop your blood glucose levels, that is a very big deal. Yes, you won't get those comorbidities. And you're going to say, well, it takes a while to get those comor comorbidities. They didn't just start the week before these people got sick. Yeah, that's correct. Um, then I should also say there's a number of studies out there, and you could go into PubMed or Google Scholar and go um, elevated glucose slash diabetes slash obesity and um, flu incidents. And you'll find out that we're really talking the same thing or, or, or virus, whatever. You'll see that there'll be a number of studies come up that do have this correlation. So we don't know anything specific to say that about COVID-19 right now. We can't say that. I mean, it's all so new, even though the coronavirus, which is the larger family of the virus, right? So this is one type of the coronavirus. This this member, this mutation for this year, and it's on, it's mutating as an ongoing basis. So we don't necessarily all get the same virus. We get predominantly the same virus, but perhaps a different form. And that's how uh, a virus attenuates over time. It changes its mutation and usually gets less strong. And then the flu season's over, so to say. The COVID-19 season is over. So that's the direction it's going. And those that have chronically sustained levels of elevated blood glucose put themselves at risk for greater flus and colds, et cetera. That's the known part. The unknown part is we don't can't attach that to COVID-19 right now, but we can to coronaviruses. So there you go. We got it almost boxed in. We can almost cross that T and dot that I, but we can't technically. So globally, we're looking at, you know, uh, the United States is now number three. It's a big country. You, you would wonder, you know, why isn't uh, Russia or some of the former USSR uh, countries not there? Uh, some of them are pretty isolated, and I think some of them are, are just not even counting. I do find it surprising that uh, the Soviet Union, ah, uh, Soviet Union, right, uh, Russia is not up there. But uh, the US is now 50,000. Uh, Italy is 70,000, so we're now third. Spain is another line that's becoming uncontrolled. 
Germany is really starting to zoom up there. So you have Europe, which supposedly was spawned from what was going on in Italy that, that took very little in the way of any sort of control. And they regret it. I mean, it's a learning curve. So we're learning from them. If it wasn't for Italy, we might not have our 14 days of lockdown or a month of lockdown. As you know, schools have been canceled and um, our gym day, it, last gym day is going to be tomorrow. So I have to figure out what to do. So that's the world situation. Uh, let me go to a, another map for a slightly different perspective. Remember, today's focus for, is for me not to just regurgitate these numbers, but is to give you a, a truly what I think is a protocol for what you could do to support your immune system. To say something like that is very vague. There isn't just one immune system. There's so many components to the immune system. You can't just go, and this is good for everything. That's that's and this or this is good for everybody. That's never the case. So I'm going to outline some things that we do recommend for everybody and why that is a general recommendation. And then some specific things for this situation from what we know about the COVID-19. Back to more data. Uh, this is about, uh, let's see, in the United States. Uh, let me just break that down into states. We basically have three states that are just more or less losing control. Uh, New York is over 25,000 of cases. They've had uh, total deaths of 210 now. New Jersey, uh, this is not an order of size, but in terms of, let's see if I can get a map here. Um, the states that are obviously have the most cases are New York. It's a large case and heavily populated. You have California, and this supposedly, well, the case number one in the United States was in Washington state. So it varies a lot. And now it's spreading around a lot. And we all get to see the same map and it's updated at every newscast you either listen to or watch on YouTube. And Massachusetts was kind of a surprise with a uh, Biogen employee sort of passing it around unbeknownst that he was the guy or one of the people who came back from Italy, apparently. So that's the local thing. And so what they know about the specifics of COVID-19 is that the points of greatest importance are far more men are dying than women at a ratio of three to one. Reasons are unknown. Mean age of death, and this is primarily from Italy, by the way, but it's collective, uh, is 78, 78 and a half. Women is slightly older than men. 2% of those dying had no comorbidities. In other words, they were healthy. So you can't always say as a comorbidity, but that's 2% as opposed to the 98% that did. 50% uh, had three or more comorbidities. Symptoms, 1% were coughing up blood. 8% had diarrhea. 40% had a cough. 73% difficulty breathing. And 76% had a fever. And a fever, it's a low-grade fever. Um, and by the way, the difference between a bacterial infection and a viral infection is really the height of the fever. Uh, fevers are notorious for low-grade, long-term fevers. Bacterial infections are high fevers. We're talking five, four, five, and six, 104, five, and six, and uh, usually come and go quickly. Okay, 96.5% died of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Think of lungs, obviously, at the center of it. So therefore, secondarily, would be the heart. And uh, it goes from there. There have been deaths under 50. There have not been any deaths under 30. And one of the things that has come up is that I'm going to go to this thing called uh, ACE inhibitor to receptor medications. So what does that mean? They, the actual virus, the actual virus is now known to connect with the cell that is about to infect at, at a receptor that is called the ACE2 receptor. And so the ACE2 receptor also happens to be the receptor that a lot of anti-hyperintensive medications, that is medications used for high blood pressure. So if you are on what they call an ARB, which is that kind of medication for high blood pressure, that connects to that and it blocks that particular receptor, that's its mechanism. It's part of the N angiotensin converting enzyme scenario process. I'm not going to go into all that, but so just say it's right down to that receptor. So by coincidence, you might say, this is actually a pretty important receptor. 
the theory, the working theory of that particular medication was block the receptor and we will, has to do with the kidneys, the kidneys will absorb less sodium primarily. And if it absorbs, if it, um, yeah, keeps more sodium, it keeps less sodium in the blood, then it will also keep less water in the blood. And so therefore, uh, that would be low blood pressure. The opposite would be if you didn't block that receptor is the kidneys would absorb, retain, if you will, more sodium, and therefore water follows sodium into your vessels. So you'd have more fluid in your vessels and therefore you'd have higher blood pressure systemically. So that's how that works. All right, well, that's not a problem. So the question then is, is it a problem that you tell everybody on that kind of medication to get off it and find either don't be on any hypertensive medications, antihypertensive medications, or do you find a different one for them? Nobody knows for sure, but more and more uh, knowledgeable, much more knowledgeable people than myself are saying, yep, get these people off that particular medication. So it's an ACE2 receptor blocker would be uh, otherwise known as ARB um, is the medication that's of concern. The other thing about this particular medication, well, let me, let me come back to that for a second. So, okay, we got that out of the way and that is a separate issue. Do you tell people to do it, to stay on it or not? Here's the information. Um, there's people that we're working with in our program. I give them information. I say, talk to your doctor and make sure, and here's the reference to these particular studies. Here's a reference for these particular opinions. Have that conversation. So that's kind of how, how I deal with it. However, there's a backside to ACE inhibitors in general and these ARBs, and they cause a zinc deficiency, probably among other things, but they are documented as creating a zinc deficiency. Why would that be a problem? Well, that's a problem both for heart muscle. Uh, the heart becomes uh, low on zinc. I was about to say depleted, so we'll say partially depleted. But the problem with zinc, it's a big immune regulator. It's a big part of your immune system. So you are on this medication to drop down your uh, blood pressure, but you're putting yourself at risk immunologically. So now we can say, well, that medication puts you at risk in two ways immunologically. The receptor thing that I just finished talking about and now about zinc. So that then begins for me to open up this list of what would I recommend for an immune protocol. And I think this is pretty important. And this is definitely what I would do. When this first started, before, before I bought into the idea that was actually a serious thing to focus on, so that's now back about a month or so ago, I was either slow or fast, depending who you talk to, right? Um, that, you know, as a t vitamin C was used a lot in China. And so there's a number of direct testimonials about China, uh, simply people taking oral vitamin C. So we've talked about that. And the thing about vitamin C is it has such a huge range that um, you can really do anything. Yeah, you don't necessarily have to have IV uh, vitamin C, but it'd be nice if they have it in the hospital for those uh, under acute care. I don't know if that's the case or not. But if you're taking it orally, it's a big deal. So I would take at least two grams a day and you can go up to five, 10, 15, 20 grams a day if you can tolerate it gradually. And so that would be one thing. Just watch when you, uh, it's generally we used to prescribe it as take it to bowel tolerance, but some people have a pretty high tolerance, so it's better just to give them the numbers. The other thing is as you come off vitamin C, taper down because you can induce, induce a, what they call a rebound scurvy. So a rebound scurvy is suddenly you stop taking it and your body is still used to excreting it at a certain, uh, at a certain volume, and you then go into uh, a couple of weeks of depletion. Now you're going to be very low on vitamin C and you'll probably get the canker sores and a few other things that one gets when they have scurvy. Okay. So keep that in mind and everything's fine. You don't have to stay on it forever. Vitamin D would be the other one. So uh, I take 5,000 I use of vitamin D3 coupled together with vitamin K2. And I do that at least uh, four times, four days of a seven day week. Why don't I do it every day? I frankly think that 5,000 I use taken consistently over month after month is too much. But I think taking my 20,000 per week as we go through this is fine. Uh, so what happens with too much? If you have, if you go nuts with, and I've, 
you know, it's, it's a thing about making any recommendation that people will take 10 times your recommendation thinking more is better. And all I can say is more is stupid. More is stupid. Just don't be stupid on this. You can induce uh, various bone spurs. And uh, I mean, I've tried this out myself. When you find out if I start to get a certain neck ache, I will drop my vitamin D and within three days, that neck pain will go away. It's a, a remnant from a skiing accident of a while ago. Uh, a while ago. So um, so that's the vitamin D part. To that, I would also put on uh, NAC, N-acetylcysteine. It's a precursor for glutathione. It's the largest, um, the largest antioxidant in the body. And also it's mucolytic. So it's going to dry you up. And that's a good thing. So if you're starting to get sort of uh, mucusy in the course of all this, so in one way, if you're not sick at all, it's a preventative because you're now keeping your um, antioxidant high in your body. That's a good thing. And once you start, should you ever start manifesting any of the symptoms, the respiratory symptoms, it will keep you drier for longer, which is a good thing. Uh, well, I mean, not uh, being moist is good to an extent, but uh, not suffocating in your own uh, mucus. Okay. Um, so to that, we had we have zinc and um, zinc you could do, the thing about zinc, it has to be paired with copper at about a 10 to one ratio. Um, zinc sulfate is really pretty, uh, not very absorbable. So we recommend zinc picolinate or even zinc elemental zinc, but still with all of those, make sure it's paired with uh, copper. So certain minerals have to be paired and that's just the way it goes for a lot of reasons. If you don't take copper with zinc, you will then become copper deficient. The zinc will push out the copper and then you will suffer the consequences of being copper deficient, which has a lot to do with vision. And I mean, no one thing is, a, no one mineral is just responsible for one thing. So you'd be causing a problem, a pretty big problem. Okay. So we have the zinc, we have the vitamin D, we have the NAC and why would some of these things work? There is a treatment out there that is a combination of uh, hydroxy, hydroxychloroquine. So hydroxychloroquine, otherwise known as Plaquenil, and Plaquenil is used for malaria. And so why would you use a malaria medication like they're doing in France and uh, two other countries that have actually started to report the res their results? And it's pretty outstanding. It's like almost up to 100% of those in critical need we're giving, we're given hydroxychloroquine and z -Pak, um, which is an antibiotic. It's a respiratory antibiotic given for bronchitis and, and uh, respiratory symptoms. So when you put these two together, they put these two together, it was a real win. But back to the hydroxychloroquine, the Plaquenil. The reason it works so much is it punches a hole in the virus in the cell wall of the virus that lets zinc in. Zinc is really good for your immune system if it can get to the inside of the cell. And it really can't get to the inside of the cell by itself as an ion. So it's nice it's in the serum, but it's got to get into the cell and it's an anti-RNA replicator, which is what you need to stop the virus from replicating. So the hydroxychloroquine pops a hole in it specifically for zinc ions. Isn't that impressive? So having more zinc will probably be more effective, but making sure, and, and when I'm recommending that people take zinc, I'm not so much re recommending that they take more of it. So you're going to have a surplus of zinc. That's not the objective. It's that most people are pretty zinc deficient. So we're making sure that at least you're not zinc deficient. And so at least there's enough zinc around that some of that will be by osmosis or some of the minor minor back channel ways will say it gets into the cells and helps um, sequester some of the RNA replication of the virus. But with these two medications, the hydroxychloroquine and the Z-Pak, azithromycin, um, that these two together were incredible and you add zinc to that, it's, it's over the top. So that's a real winner. So hearing about the hydroxychloroquine and um, and the Z-Pak combination 
really made me think that, you know, zinc is a player here. So uh, have some zinc. My history with zinc over the last uh, two decades of working with patients is it was all a rage about two decades ago and sort of stayed in that sort of seasonal way of things you could do. But however, I never saw a great benefit of it. You know, they had throat lozenges and you could take it orally, of course. Um, and it wasn't anybody that said, yeah, I got over my cold or flu in half the time or something. It's just, I never saw that. And so it was one of those things that you took on faith. Yeah, there were some studies out there that were hoping that were good and you continue doing it and people would take it. So I didn't see any, wow, this is great. Um, and nor did anybody die. So that's a good thing. But so it's one of those things I do think is vital. I do think your vitamin vitamin D is vital. I think your vitamin C is very important. And um, and your NAC is something that just helps respiratorily. Uh, the, the amount of time, that's probably the number one thing I see people take it and they go, oh, wow, I really cleared up. I feel great. And it gave them a way to breathe again. So um, let me go for some of these, a few other things that you should know about in terms of... Um, symptoms and so on. And, and uh, I was looking for the days of how long it took to become infectious and so on. I don't have that right in front of me. It's usually about three days. And so the idea back to the 14 days of, um, you know, settling at home is that if everybody actually went to their home and we also had a mandatory worldwide you know, lockdown, quote unquote, except for those services for 14 days, is that, well, by three days, we'd find out who's already infected. They would then start showing their symptomology and they would either, most of them would be able to stay at home and just sort of weather it out like a regular flu. And those that had to go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And those were obviously critical, go to the hospital. So what you did is you write in those two weeks and were actually the first three days, you were three or four days, you're able to identify who was A, at risk, who was progressing into needing care and who was progressing into needing critical care. And by the end of the 14 days, all the people that initially felt symptoms would be over it. Uh, those in the hospital that uh, were not in critical, they were taken care of, so they'd be over it because they were isolated. And then you're left with basically those who are in critical care are still in the hospital uh, getting what they need. So that would reduce the numbers of beds that are required so when we don't all this do this together, it's a problem and it could last on for months and months and months. And this is basically the answer that brought the 1918 pandemic to a close faster because after they, this was now, remember they had three waves. By the time the third wave showed up, they were getting that isolation was a big deal. So my take is that with some of these things you could do at home, it's uh, surprising by the way, how, how many of these places are basically out of vitamin D or NAC or zinc. I think the uh, the common ones people know about are vitamin D and zinc. And so there are a lot of places are just gone, but see what you can find. Remember it's zinc, pickle, and eight. Uh, vitamin C really does matter just whether it's oral or it's buffered. Um, and if you take a lot of vitamin C, you may get a burning in your stomach because it is ascorbic acid, but let that be the minor part of the whole situation. And you should be good to go. Keep up your fluids. Make sure to keep up your fluids. Why are you going to keep up your fluids? Well, at the very least, you won't get kidney stones, right? Not um, That's not associated with vitamin C comment. Um, keep up your fluids because it just washes things out. It goes out with urine and stool. So you need to stay hydrated if you can. Okay. So that brings me to the end of listing my protocol of things that I would require for anybody who came into my office saying, this is a situation, what can I do? That's what you can do. You have your vitamin C, you have your zinc, you have your vitamin D, you have your NAC. And if you're about essential oils and so on, the one thing we would have patients do at home is they would get some fresh thyme, which is you can go buy in the grocery, grocery store. They would bring, get a pot of water and they would bring it to a boil of maybe just an inch or so thick, take that hot water off the stove so it's no longer cooking, throw in your sprigs, of time and you would put a towel over the back of your head and you would try to get your head down into the pan as close as you could, you know, and that's so you're burning their nostrils from the steam. But what you're doing is you are steaming the time and the essential oils you give time. And we're not time specific. People go, I heard about oregano is good too. And I heard about a eucalyptus and I heard about all those have their effects, but time is the one. 
time is the one and this is what you can do and that tends to it was a big deal for a lot of people so you can steam time so with that i think you got a lot of things you could do i hope you do some of them and i hope you do understand my connection of why low carb is really 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 important you know so just start doing that now and bring down you know so the other thing is like if i've just talked you into getting your blood sugars down by dropping carbs what i've also talked to you talked you out of was getting processed foods out of your freaking house they have no process they have no reason no process they have no purpose being in your house they are just going to cause you to go in the wrong direction so get rid of your processed foods just eat strictly whole foods you don't have to be like me which is primarily meats and fish and so on uh, pretty high protein and f- and fat that, that comes with the protein for the most part i'm fine with that but just have it be whole foods, not processed foods. So have your salads and yes, have them be organic if you can get them organic and let that be your food while you're in-house. If you start resorting to a lot of convenience food or emotional eating, quote unquote, you're really just opening up a door to addiction. And that's the addiction of carbohydrates, processed food, carbohydrates at that. So you're getting a lot of other things that will compromise your immune system. So get those out. It's a carb ref. It's a carb recommendation as well, right? Drop the carbs. That sort of goes without saying. Get the processed foods out. Uh, That's the way it should be. And uh, enjoy whole foods. Try not to drink too much alcohol. Clearly, when you're all boxed in, whether you're with kids or without kids, with your parents or your grandparents, some is okay. Too much definitely will tank your immune system. All right. So till next time, take care of yourself. And I hope we'll be further along. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I just wanted to encourage you to send in your questions to drgoldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Many of you have, and so what I've done with these questions that I've gotten back to most of the people I email, but some of the questions that were so good, and if they were overlapping to other questions, I would combine them and try to put that into the topic of a podcast, either via one of the micro topics that are covered in an interview. As you know, we cover a lot of topics in any given interview or some of my own sort of reporting, if you will, on some of these issues. So uh, please keep the questions coming. Feel free to send in an email and uh, I will get back to you. One thing I want to say, a number of questions have come in in which I've given this answer and the email didn't work. So just make sure that you're receiving at the same email that you sent it in. And I think that might've been the difficulty. So I look forward to your questions. I just wanted to make sure that you knew that I'm open to answer your questions. And I think this world of keto is not just black and white. You know, it's nice that it's simple, but it's not simple for some. I'm really trying to, you know, go down as anybody any of you who have listened to all my podcasts, we started way back when, history and evolution, and epilepsy, and so on and so forth. You know, now we're seeing some tremendous overlap in uh, various uh, mental disorders, such as schizophrenia or neurological disorders that are not just epilepsy. And also, just for people in losing weight, it's sometimes pretty complicated for them to engage in keto, and so they need some help. And so that's the whole point of at least that's what I think I'm doing, is exploring the world of why are there other factors? And so in exploring some of those other factors, we've covered addiction, we've covered hormones, we've covered uh, nutritional deficiencies, we've covered certain metabolic lab results, and we'll go further. We'll even get to more on genome and aspects. So these are all just contributions that make for an obstacle for some people to engage easily in the ketogenic diet. This is my belief, and these are the things that I've discovered. And I think other people have discovered some of these things, but not ever put them together. So stay listening, send in your questions, and I will definitely get back to you.